Now we analyze the experimental results. The first step is typically to do descriptive statistics. This is a good, good basis for plausibility tests. So we can see whether there's something which was obviously wrong or did not turn out as expected. Also, as part of that, we want to check whether our participant distribution is as we expected it to be uh, and whether some other problems can be already seen. So that's the main reason why we do descriptive statistics. This is also the basis for some outlier removal. Then we analyze actually the experiment. Can some hypothesis be accepted or refuted? Meaning, do we accept H0 or H1? Uh, what's the confidence level? And so on. We talked about statistics a lot back in the statistics lecture, so I will not go into too much detail here. Of course, when you do the testing, we need to make sure that they fit the scales that we used really for the experiment. And also, this may give us an indication on to what extent the results can be generalized. Here's the data from this running example. Have a look at these different categories. So we have here the experience people had, like non, they had a book or a course, they have a few months of industrial experience and they have more than a few months of industrial experience. How many people are in each category? We see that none is larger than all the others combined. Here's the median and the mean and the standard deviation. And here we already see something very interesting if we just look at this data. The median for the non-group is actually smaller than for the book course group and just slightly higher than for the uh, industrial people. So this is the median of false per kilo lines of code, meaning how many defects they have or what is a defect density. Uh, if you however look at the mean, it's way higher and the standard deviation gives us an explanation. So the standard deviation is extremely high. Um, you see in general a slight tendency, but actually surprisingly little, that with more experience the defect density uh, becomes lower. So we now do a box plot to identify if there are some outliers and that's what we get. What we see here is, oh wow, you know, so the average is here the 66 Point 0.8. Um, we have here this interval um, and then we have here 145 which is pretty much on the high side and then 398.1. So this is really extremely high. Uh, so this is more than five times the median value. Uh, so that, this is probably a very good candidate to remove as an outlier, at least this one. Uh, so 145, we could argue, but it's just outside of the range, so in that case it was left in. As a result, the data was reduced, so um, there are different ways of how data reduction should be done. In general, some people argue net data should never be reduced. However, I would personally also say if there's obviously faulty data, meaning if like in this case there's one which is completely not comparable to the remaining distribution, then that is a good point to to really uh, remove this data point. So the second category is really to do single data points removal, that is so-called outline removal. And that is what I think makes a lot of sense usually and also in this specific case. So here we remove the extreme outlier 
because it may actually invalidate a potentially valid relationship, yeah? because it may just disturb the data to the extent that we are no longer seeing any pattern that is truly in the data. So we have it here as a result. You see the median is more or less stable. Uh, it's still in between of the book and the industrial case. We have a mean of 72 now, which is just a little bit higher than for the other categories. Uh, and the standard deviation was basically half as high now with just this single removal than it was before. Uh, so this is a much more uh, plausible distribution and a much more acceptable distribution of the data uh, simply by removing one out of 32. Of course, one have to take care. If I now would have removed like five data points, I might have created artificially uh, a result that is not truly representative of the data. Uh, so that in outline remover, we always have to take take care how how we do it and we should not do it too aggressively. Next, we have again an exercise. Which effects on the result of a study can outlier removal have? Again, take your time, read through the four different options, stop the video, and then come back once you are finished. Welcome back. So, here we go. The first one, non, it just helps for better statistics, would be nice, but that's not the case, unfortunately, it can have some effects. B is actually a correct answer. It can happen that an effect that could not be observed without outlier removal can suddenly be observed. Simply by removing incorrect data, we make the signal more clear within all the noise of the incorrect data. Uh, and suddenly, statistically, this may become relevant. This is exactly also part of the problem. We can artificially create a statistical relation sometimes, which is not truly in the data, by just declaring some data points as outlier and removing them. Uh, so that is what we have to avoid. C. It can happen that an effect that could be observed without it can suddenly not be observed. That can also be true. We might have a statistical relationship and um, suddenly by removing the outliers it's not no longer as strong. In some sense you just saw that with the outlier we had an extremely high number of faults per individual in the non-group where we expect the highest um, number of faults anyway. Uh, so it actually, the outlier made the effect that we would expect stronger than it was after we did the removal. Uh, so that can also happen. Yeah, and of course that's in the risk if the outlier removal is incorrect. Uh, and D, unfortunately, is also not true. Hypothesis testing requires us to take the appropriate type of uh, statistical test and in this overview slide you actually have a collection of the different tests and relating them to the different kind of experimental designs. So for example here we have a one factor one treatment experiment, one factor two treatments where it's completely randomized, uh, one factor two treatments with paired comparison and so on. So these are different tests we can have as parametric versus non-parametric tests. And here we have uh, for one factor more than two treatments. That's for example ANOVA testing or also for more than one factor. Uh, so I don't want to dig into the details of that. This slide is just to give you an idea that there is a clear relationship between the experimental design that we are doing, whether some, uh, whether the underlying distributions are parametric or non-parametric, and the kind of testing that is appropriate in the given situation. In the case of this experiment, 
where, uh, which we take as a running example, we have one factor with more than two treatments, then we use ANOVA because more than two treatments are the different levels of experience the participants have. Let's now look at the running example and the hypothesis testing done there because we have multiple classes of C experience, meaning more than two. We use an ANOVA test and if we correctly apply it, we identify the degrees of freedom because we have four classes, there are three degrees of freedom uh, and we reach a p-value of 0 0.72. That's, of course, outside of the bounds, so there's no significant difference. If we do a further evaluation, well, it's obvious two of the classes are rather small, and that is a problem in such a statistical test. So instead, we compare no experience with the combination of the other three groups. But if you remember, also the group which just had a course was not significantly better than the group which had uh, nothing beforehand. So it's probably not surprising also in this, two, in this test of two classes there was no significant difference either. So as a result we can only say we cannot conclude that there is a significant relationship between C experience versus false per kilo lines of code. It should be noted however that this is really experience versus defect density, meaning this does not take into account whether, for example, beginning students may have uh, or may develop much longer programs and, and therefore actually the total number of faults for solving a problem may actually be higher. That's nothing that was analyzed here, so there's no conclusion we can draw for, uh, about this in this case. Next we need to discuss thread stability. This is about whether what we found in our analysis is really correct. And this can actually work both ways. If we did not find something, this may be due to thread stability issues, as well as if we found something, this may be due to some thread stability issues. Let's start with the first category, with conclusion validity. Conclusion validity is about the relationship between conclusion and outcome, or to put it differently, it's mostly about statistical significance of our results and factors that may have impacted our uh, statistical result. Typical categories of issues are there might be violated assumptions of the statistical tests, for example, confusing parametric and non-parametric, um, testing, then we might have been doing fishing for outcomes. This is mostly uh, in the case of p-hacking, if we try to analyze many, many, many different uh, individual relationships, by pure chance some of them will seem to be statistically significant, but it's not a real result, it's just that by pure chance this happens, uh, just by the pure number of it. Um, there might also be things like external influences that create noise on the data and therefore obscure a true relationship that is uh, actually present in the data. If you think about our running example and the data that we had there, the standard deviation was actually pretty large. And as a result, um, a really huge difference among the individual groups would have been needed to show up as a significant relationship. Then there is internal validity. This is about whether the outcome is really dependent on the factors that we analyze or whether there would be any other effects uh, that um, may impact what we have been seeing. This can be categorized into different uh, main categories of threads. The first would be single group threads. These are learning effects, for example, among tasks. That's, for example, something that may apply in our uh, running example because people were doing that over many weeks. Of course, they learned. It was a lecture, so they were supposed to learn. 
and the results in the final tasks were definitely impacted in what they learned in the initial tasks. So they, that actually created experience and may have obscured any effect that may have been present in the initial tasks because uh, of this additional experience that they got during the lecture. Exhaustion is an issue leading, leading potentially to negative results. Then there might be issues with the design of the material leading to a situation where we uh, have, for example, more errors because uh, guidelines were incorrect and then people actually behave wrong. Um, mortality is an issue because, for example, if people drop out, the behavior of those people who drop out may be in a systematic way different from those who do not drop out, changing the overall outcomes that we observe among the group of those who finish everything. Then there's multiple group threats. These are threats that may be due to the situation where different groups that receive different treatments may actually be affected differently by the single group threats. Uh, and therefore, um, we have a different impact on the individual treatments uh, by these kind of threats. Create therefore uh, a signal or a, a potential relationship which is actually then due to the single group threat uh, things like learning and so on uh, and may be obscured by uh, or might may be confused with uh, the impact of the treatment itself. Finally we have social threats for example, learning among groups you know, may be an issue that obscure any differences, actually. Imitation of behavior, underdog behavior, and so on, demoralization, all of that may strongly impact how people behave, how they execute the experiment, and therefore what kind of results we get, and are therefore factors that have an additional impact besides the treatment itself. Then we have the, uh, construct validity. Construct validity is about the relationship between theory and observation, meaning do we measure what we think we measure? Uh, is a construct really representative of what our intent is? Uh, this may have design threats. Design threats would be things where our experiment is not correctly designed in a certain way or in a certain sense. Uh, for example, if the underlying theory is not clear, it's not really clear what should be represented by the experiment. We might have not the right or not enough measures that we take in order to understand the impact. We may have an interaction among treatments that we are not aware of or that we did not take into account, and so on. Mm -hmm. Social threats would be that uh, subjects guess the hypothesis and behave uh, as they think is expected of them, you know, or that people have problems with becoming evaluated, so-called evaluation apprehension, uh, and they take a much more effort than they would usually do, and this leads to false but better values. Uh, also, experimental biases may uh, impact negatively what we see. Finally, there is external validity. For example, that subjects may not be representative uh, of the total population, the material is not representative or generalizable, the experiment itself was influenced by history, uh, for example if it was close to a certain event, people pay attention to different things, and so on. It's time again for another exercise. 
We will use our running example again, the one with the PSP cores and the defect density. And the task for you is to come up with some additional threads to validity you can think of and try to place them in these four categories that we always have, conclusion validity, internal validity, construct validity and external validity and try to identify at least one per category. Stop the video and try to finish this task. Welcome back. Now this is input for discussion. The next step is packaging the experiment. Once we have done all the experiments, we have to discuss the results. What are the outcomes? What did we show? What could we not show? So this is basically where we drive the scientific understanding forward based on the experiment that we did. And then we document the results. Uh, we can use the structure that we provided here in this lecture as a basis and of course all the threats of to validity need to be discussed in detail. A major question is to what degree can we generalize the results because typically of course if it's only about the group on which we experimented there is no, no generalization, then it's not an interesting experiment. Also, it's good practice to provide the material for validation and replication uh, externally. This can be a download from a website. There are specific websites like Zenodo, which are specifically for scientific archiving, and this can be used and should be used uh, for others so they can replicate your experiment. Let's go and have a look at our running example. The outcomes were that computer science students are significantly more productive than electrical engineering students. This is something we did not discuss so much in detail but was an outcome regarding the other research question from this same study. For the defects, there was no statistical significance. Uh, this may be calm significant with more students, uh, but um, it seemed that experience does not affect the faults uh, in a very significant manner. Or it could also be that inexperienced students write longer programs with more faults, this was actually not further analyzed as part of the experiment. So this is a, um, actually a gateway towards additional, towards further experiments, probably with other factors that also should be looked at. Regarding validity, uh, the productivity finding is reasonable and no surprise, uh, and also a discussion of threats to validity showed that within certain limits, that's at least a, an adequate result. With that, we have finished our discussion of human experiments, so let me briefly summarize. The idea of controlled experiments with human subjects is to measure the effects of some sort of treatment on humans. It's basically whenever we have a human in the loop, and we want to understand the effect it, uh, it has, for example, a method or a tool where people interact with the tool, that's basically uh, something where a controlled experiment along the lines discussed in this lecture would be appropriate. The approach of experimentation must consider the human effect, meaning learning effects and behavioral effects that may change the outcomes or influence the outcomes in a significant way must be understood and taken into account. There are a lot of simple mistakes that you can make if you conduct such an experiment. 
You know? And some of them you even find in scientific literature, which is puzzling, but uh, yeah, the reality is also scientists are not necessarily automatically perfect. There are some advantages. You can really show differences and improvements over st uh, using statistics, so there's a quantitative approach underlying it. This is uh, much stronger in certain sense than purely qualitative research. Um, it can be replicated using the same material guidelines and analysis approach. Usually there's a lot of support uh, for experiments already out there. Um, there's some weaknesses, however, as well. The setting is artificial. It's some sort of laboratory setting where you perform a controlled experiment. In some cases more and some less, but it's always some artificial component. It's not easy to repeat it with the same, especially with the same subjects. It's basically impossible because they already did some learning. So the second time round, they would actually behave somewhat different. And there is a very high effort for measurement and execution control. So this really uh, limits the applicability of this research method significantly. If we really try to do well carried out experiments, then this is an awful lot of work, but for some kind of research question, it's just the best available research approach. Uh, and as we stated earlier, um, because we really get statistically significant results and quantitative results, this is also a benefit that other research methods with human in the loop do not provide us with.